All right. Well, uh, start to get ready. Eric, are you out there? Yep. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. How you been? Doing really well. Yeah, good. Matt, are you out there as well? I am. Thanks for coming. Glad you guys uh, both made it. Made it to... Matt, how do you say your last name real quick for us? Sorry, one more time. How do you say your last name? Orm. Salami. Orm. Okay. Make sure I didn't want to butcher it too bad. So. <laughs> I answered anything, Mike. I'm easy. Well, thank you both for coming. Uh, just a you know, a real quick for everybody that's uh, on uh, on the line. Um, yeah, Eric had had come uh, last year. Uh, you know, both Matt and Eric uh, worked with Michael Bryant over at SecureWorks. Um, SecureWorks has been uh, one of our our sponsors from from day one. We really appreciate all the work that that they do. Uh, especially, you know, Michael in support of not only B-Size Greenville, but B-Size everywhere. Uh, he's always the first first person to be there for everyone. And so that's just, uh, it brings a lot of amazing opportunities to a lot of people. And uh, so Eric came last year uh, when we were at uh, the Clemson uh, International uh, Center for Automotive Research or at ICAR uh, and ran our Wi-Fi security workshop, which everyone had a blast with. Um, and had really had a great time, learned a lot. Um, you know, Eric is, is definitely uh, by far one of uh, the top Wi-Fi guys uh, in the world. Uh, we really appreciate him taking the time to, to come share with the group. Uh, I think Eric only has X amount of black badges from DEF CON. Uh, how many do you have, Eric, in your collection? Oh, I, I only have one. Uh, our team okay. has won several, but yeah, I only have one personally. I, that would, that would feel bad to have multiple of those. <laughs> they kind of they limit you after one and one and done. <laughs> so, uh, so again, I really appreciate both of you to for coming to to share with the group. And uh, so with that, I will uh, turn it over. Which one of you needs to share your screen? Uh, that will be me. So let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, all right. Uh, um, let's see, it is going to be um, all right, view in full screen mode. No, we go ahead. Am I missing it somewhere? Oh, there we go. Perfect. I guess I had to be the, the what's it called? The presenter. Yeah, I guess I missed it. It was going to be you. I wasn't sure it was going to be you or me. So please cool. chat. That. Awesome. Yeah, we can see your screen perfectly. So our, I will get out of the way. And uh, thank you again both. And uh, Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's see. Let's make this screen. All right, can you guys see that okay? Is it full screen? Perfect. Awesome. Cool. All right. Uh, so, um, like Mike was saying, my name is Eric Escobar, uh, and man, those are those are way too kind of words. <laughs> I do not think that highly of myself, but I appreciate that. Um, and then uh, Matt Orm is also here on the line. He's a good friend of mine. We both work at SecureWorks. We uh, came from Barracuda, and we live not that far away from each other. So. Uh, um, we do a lot more than just than just computer things. Um, so Matt, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah, I'm a uh, principal consultant um, with the adversarial group here at SecureWorks. Um, been doing this uh, the security thing for almost ten years now. Um, wireless is fun, uh, and it's everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think I would like to kind of just point out that our talk is going to be, you know. Um, kind of in the direction of wireless and Wi-Fi always seem to be kind of that redheaded stepchild for a pen test. Um, when in reality, uh, you know, wireless is almost everywhere. There, you know, almost every corporation, government out there has some kind of wireless network. Um, and really that's just an extension of your internal network, um, but it's out there for everybody to see. And so our talk is kind of gonna delve into 
um, you know, what that looks like, what that means for your company and some of the things that, uh, you know, an adversary can look at and see without, you know, without you even realizing. So without further ado, let's keep going. Let's see if I can click through this. Cool. Um, so this started out a, a while ago with, um, you know, my idea of, hey, I have a two-year-old at home and I don't want to travel and do wireless pen testing. So I'm going to try and figure out a better way um, you know, to have a platform that we can test remotely from and to have like basically a, a smaller device that's fairly inexpensive that we can uh, keep on a person um, so that we don't ever have to really worry about, you know, is, you know, is your Wi-Fi up to date or trying to pass your, you know, your wireless cards through a VM or anything like that. Um, and so this is my, my very first iteration from a bunch of years ago. It's basically just Raspberry Pi with a battery pack and uh, a single 2.4 gigahertz TP-Link adapter. Um, the whole goal of this was basically just to keep it, um, you know, just just keep this in my uh, pocket, and then I was able to control it, um, you know, via hotspot and uh, an SSH client, as you can see. So, um, if any of you guys out there are familiar with uh, AeroDump, this should be a fairly uh, familiar screen. Basically, this is just what I can see on my phone. It is, um, you know, I'm I'm screened into uh, an AeroDump session so that I can monitor all the wireless traffic around me just from my phone. Um, and the obvious advantages of that are that if you've ever been on a wireless pen test um, and you come walking down the hallway and your laptop looks like a porcupine because of all the antennas coming out of it, um, any any adversary, any you know person trying to do something dastardly uh, is going to see you coming from a mile away, and they're going to know to um, you know they're going to know to like turn off whatever they're broadcasting or you know close out of any screens. Uh, you're going to be super obvious, and so this. This uh, device is basically meant to dissuade that, and it was kind of born out of the um, wireless capture the flag when you're chasing uh, foxes, which are basically just people that have um, uh, people that have like an access point in their pocket, right? And so if you're trying to chase them down uh, and they can see you coming, um, they're going to run away from you. So it's, it's kind of twofold: one for the wireless capture the flag, but then also for um, just clients in general. Um, it, it proved to be really useful. Matt, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, just generally, right? If you're if you're walking around, you got like a backpack on, your hands are free, you got your mobile device out. I um, mean, just kind of blend right in, like Eric was saying. The other the other piece of that too, when you're not walking with the one hand as laptop tray, other hand as as keyboard navigator. Um, I find my situational awareness is a little better, a little bit more uh, aware of of sort of the environment that I'm in. Um, and doing wireless when you're trying to man in the middle clients, right? That Sometimes that awareness is really sort of your your most important tool, right? Get get AeroDump or uh, you know whatever man in the middle framework tools you like using um, running. You don't you don't really need to keep eyes on that 24/7. Um, so the fact that you can just sort of switch back to phone mode and look around, um, keep an SSH terminal open on your phone without having to have your laptop out is just a it's a win all the way around. Yeah, and the other thing that that's also really nice about it that um, that maybe we'll talk about going forward is um, since since the Raspberry Pi is being phoned home to our you know to our C2 to our Pen Lab infrastructure, um, any one of our other consultants at SecureWorks can look at my you know they can hop into that same screen session you know from their keyboard and mouse with three screens um, and they can you know they can say go back look at this look at that um, so that is that is definitely another powerful piece is that you can have basically a remotely operated person that's gonna walk around, and get your coverage um, and somebody else watch. And so that's kind of a cool piece of it as well. Um, let's see how do I keep clicking. Uh, so this is Matt's backpack and I'll let him uh, tell you about that. Yeah, so you can see there's a bunch of bunch of nefarious looking stuff on the outside. Uh, there's a 90B alpha omni um, on that right hand picture and then a panel alpha, uh, the little adapter there is just it's a regular alpha. Uh, 2.4 gigahertz, they come in those sort of bulbous cases, um, and they're like, you know, highlighter yellow or whatever, <laughs> whatever stupid color. Uh, so you'll see in a couple pictures further into the slide, we, we built this appliance um, where we stuff a whole bunch of hardware into a gun case, basically. Um, one of the things we needed to do was, was really sort of put a premium on space for that. Um, so you can see that's just like a little custom 3D printed, Adapter. Oh, slide went forward, and then you can see also. Yeah, yeah, I'm just kind of toggling back and forth. <laughs> so you can see on the on the left there's gray, on the right there's a blue. I have uh, a couple different USB adapters just sort of stuck to the outside of the backpack. And then can you hop one forward, Eric? Yep. 
Yeah, and then inside the backpack, you can see it's just a couple of pies. Um, and again, 3D printed, uh, just some cases that hold the Anchor 10K milliamp hour battery, um, which is enough to power both uh, a Pi and two USB NICs for the better part of eight hours. Um, so I'm literally walking around, right? It's the the tactical backpack, which whatever is kind of a kind of a stupid move on my part. Um, but I think we were actually doing some big external environment that day. Um, but you can see instead of having, you know, a whole bunch of kit hanging, hanging off and like antennas in my hands tied up with laptops and, and radios or whatever, um, I'm literally just a backpack and a dude dressed relatively corporate, um, blending in, blending into the noise. Right. Um, so it's just kind of, kind of the same thing. Like a lot of little incremental improvements to wireless testing uh, has basically led us to this place where we can do a bunch of wireless stuff that people just aren't really doing. And, and one thing too that like so so Matt touched on it for for a second, and this engagement was uh, us walking through a very heavily crowded theme park um, for about a week, That's and right. yeah. no one and no one you know knew any of the wiser. They didn't realize that we were catching credentials, you know, from a fortune giant company, the, you know, they had no idea that, you know, we just look like any other park guest, park attendant with a backpack, um, you know, maybe slightly better dress. Um, I may still have flip flops on, but, uh, um, but what, what this gets you is it gets you the, the ability to just kind of blend in, um, which when people think of wireless pen tests, they think of pineapples, they think of, um, you know, antennas and all these things, you know, all this like, right, like the guy at DEF CON every it. year with the crazy cactus <laughs> thing on his back. Yeah, the, 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 what is this, the cactus? What is, is it the, I forget what his name is, but yeah, the- uh, Cact pie? Yeah, cact, yeah, uh, is that it? Yeah, maybe, uh, anyway. Um, the other, so the other powerful piece of this is that uh, when when we do a wireless pen test, um, you know, a lot of the times people just think of internal and external pen tests. Your internal pen test is typically, uh, you know, you're simulating an adversary on your internal network, whether that's from, you know, one of your end users clicking on some malicious email or phishing link, um, you know, whether you have a rogue employee that wants to do you some harm or, you know, some someone breaches your physical security and implants the device. Um, you know, those are kind of the, the, the things that an internal pen test simulates. And an external pen test is, is, you know, the opposite of that. It's somebody on the public internet trying to, you know, hop on your VPN, trying to, you know, pop your Outlook web access um, or any other like Citrix or any other, you know, stuff that that's on your public facing internet existence. But the thing that that, people, that many people don't really even think about or really even care about is their their wireless security and what Wi-Fi networks they're putting out there. Um, because uh, when you look at it, you know, you think of any other building, you know, so this is just some stock image of like some stock building, but it's not dissimilar from many of our clients, um, you know, and, and I could very easily just sit on a park bench um, and point, uh, you know, a directional antenna or sometimes just, just have my Omni antenna and pick up wireless signal. And if I'm able to compromise that network, compromise credentials, um, I'm able to then hop on that network and I am on your internal network without any real logs or any real, um, you know, uh, um, I guess, su suspicion that something had happened, right? And, um, and kind of going with that, what ends up happening in this scenario is that more often than not on a wireless pen test, we are, you know, thrown onto an internal network once we've, once we've compromised it. And it's it's very few steps to a normal internal pen test, which you know typically leads to domain admin um, pretty darn quickly. Matt, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, no, I mean I, I think it's worth sort of back referencing to to the point you made earlier about um, when we show up to do a wireless pen test. You know, since since we have this sort of remote device capabilities um, to do remote wireless. You really do, um, instead of having sort of one consultant um, sort of in a bubble on site doing doing this work for you, you really sort of do open the door to the whole the whole stable of uh, of our team, right? So somebody gets on, right? Eric is able to compromise an account, um, winds up with Active Directory credentials, is accessing, you know, some segmented part of the wireless network, finds a web app. Um, pulls in a, somebody from our team who specializes in web apps all the time, 24 seven, that's what they're doing. So Eric is able to then set up a proxy, get get uh, one of our web app ninjas, 
working on a web app over wireless and, and you sort of start to see how this full spectrum <laughs> kind of test unfolds, right? We came on, wireless was the point in, um, but you really wind up with, with a full security exercise of your internal network out of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll cover some of the other ways that that external pen tests uh, help, help kind of like our internal and, and wireless and how that works too. So let's see what else we got here. Um, so uh, this is this is one of the tools that we use. It's called Wi-Fi Fisher. Um, so at the end of the day, a lot of wireless testing is really, you know, it's like most things in, in computer security that uh, in general, computers are secure. It's the people that are, you know, your, your greatest weakness. Um, and so this screen, basically what, what it does is it's a tool that um, stands up a rogue access point. And if you're not familiar with what a rogue access point is, it's basically just, just a wireless hotspot. It's, it's a wireless network that, um, that shouldn't be there. Um, so the only difference between a rogue access point and normal access point is that one shouldn't be there and one should. One's trying to do nefarious things and the other one is just, you know, giving you access to, to corporate resources or, you know, just, just internet resources. Um, and so when you kind of look at the screen, you see, oh, well, I'm just standing up uh, an access point and it will um, try and deauthenticate somebody from, from the network that they're connected to, the one that you're targeting. And so in this case, you know, uh, that'll just kick them off with the hope that, oh, maybe they'll rejoin your wireless. Um, and so you can see what happens here is that uh, when we kick them off of their wireless, they then join our wireless network. And when they join our wireless network, we will serve them up a page that looks like this. And so if anybody's seen something similar to this, it, it is the captive portal page. But really, we crafted this entire page. Or when I say we, the, the application crafted this entire page. So it says there's no internet connection. And this, uh, you know, where it's prompting for that network security key, this is actually just, you know, HTML form that, that somebody's filling out. But, it, you know, it uses the user agent from their um, device, you know. And so if you were to connect to this, you know, using an iPhone, it would pop up a Safari, you know, captive portal page. Um, if you were to connect it from an Android phone, it would pop up you know, whatever uh, that user agent would specify. So it's kind of customized automatically on the fly um, to be able to make the determination of like, hey, what are we gonna serve them up? And the idea being that, you know, an astute computer user may look at this and be like, oh, this looks kind of scammy, but to 95% of other computer users, they're gonna say, oh, I must not have, you know, the wireless password typed in correctly. Wi-Fi must be doing something kind of wonky or weird. Um, and so, when they hit next, they're basically just submitting a form of a clear text password. So you could have a 30 character fully randomized password, passphrase, whatever that may be. Um, and, and that end user is just basically being tricked into submitting it to you um, in clear text. And that's why it's called Wi-Fi Fisher because it is, you know, a normal phishing, uh, you know, exercise only done in the wireless realm. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is, this is a very similar way to how we get stolen credentials, how we compromise workstations. Um, if you really wanted to, and, and you were looking for a way to exfil data, you know, to, to steal, large amounts of corporate data, you could exfiltrate it in this way. Um, and and the other part of this too, which I think is really funny, is that uh, a lot of the times end users will use, you know, their own hotspots, their own, you know, access points um, so that they can, you know, circumvent the corporate policies. You know, maybe corporate policy doesn't allow you to watch Netflix on your, uh, you know, on your laptop. But if you, you know, if an end user pulls up their hotspot, um, you know, then, then they can use that. And so, uh, that works in our favor a lot of times because corporate policies might keep us out. But if somebody's doing something against, you know, actively against it, um, that's something that we can always exploit uh, as an adversary. Uh, I don't know, Matt, if you want to add anything to that. No. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah. So um, the next part of that is that there's always a ton of a ton of information that I don't think people realize is out there when when you know wireless is just broadcasting. Typically, people are just familiar with wireless access points when, you know, they look at their phone and they see what's around and, you know, they're trying to either connect to a guest network. Um, but really most people are, are most uh, used to seeing wireless from the form of just what does your phone say? And really there's a lot more information um, that, that is being beaconed out, that's being emitted out um, wirelessly that, that gives off a lot more data than you would think. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a quick brief look at this. So if you look, this is uh, that screen that we were looking at before of, of a tool called AeroDump. Aerodump basically just just shows in a nice uh, a nice way. I mean, this may not like look nice to you if you're not used to looking at it, but um, compared to looking at like raw um, packets in Wireshark, this this is a really great representation of all the wireless networks that are out there. So um, if you look on the left hand column, there's a column called DSSID. That's a MAC address. That's like you can think of like a, a serial number for a wireless hardware device, and that typically doesn't change. Um, and you look on the far right hand side. 
and there's something called ESSID. That's your network name. That's that's what you normally see on your phone. Um, and why that matters is that you can see all this information is just publicly available. Uh, you know, it's not encrypted. It's not you know any any end user, any person that's just sniffing Wi-Fi can see all this information, password or not. Um, and what you can see here is that there is uh, this this hardware uh, device is connected to this access point. And why that matters is because uh, every MAC address manufacturer or every manufacturer of hardware, um, you know, registers what their, you know, what their subset of their uh, serial number looks like. So you can take a look at that, you know, when I say serial number, I'm really just using a, a dumbed down version of what a MAC address is. But you can see that this device is actually a Nest, you know, a Nest device. Um, and so without, without knowing anything about this network or whatever it is, I know that, hey, maybe this is an IoT network because it has a Nest device on it, or maybe you know, a Nest device is allowed on their corporate um, you know, network, whatever that may be. This gives you insight as an attacker that you didn't need to, to exploit anything to do. You didn't need to transmit a single packet to, to see this. It gives you, um, you know, basically just a wealth of information of, hey, is this a predominantly Apple user shop? You know, do, do they have a bunch of iPhones on this network? Um, or do they have a bunch of, you know, Intel chips for maybe their corporate laptops on this network? Um, so without seeing anything, you, you can divine some information, which is um, pretty darn valuable. And then the other part of that, too, is that you can also use this to track users because um, uh, with, with wireless and with Wi-Fi, uh, you can look at signal strength. And so if you have a couple points, um, you know, you can know everybody's used to looking at their phone and seeing signal bars of Wi-Fi or of just, you know, LTE. And so you can tell, hey, how close am I to this user to this device? Um, and why that matters is that, uh, um, you know, you can track a device or a user or a access point, um, even if it's moving around. And so you can even do this through tools like Blue Sonar, which basically does the same exact thing, but for Bluetooth. And when you think of like the ability to, to track a Bluetooth device, it becomes a little scary when I can say, hey, I'm going to, you know, look for Eric's left AirPod and I'm just going to follow it. Um, so if you have a high gain antenna or, or, you know, just anything, you can just track a single user and correlate their devices, where they're going. Um, and again, all this information is publicly available. It's just one of those things you kind of have to look under the hood to, to see. Um, and yeah, so this is, uh, so th the best part about wireless is that um, all for, for at least some of our clients, an eight character password is, uh, you know, is the only thing you need to breach their security. And this is the first iteration of our, of our wireless testing appliance that Matt uh, so graciously made a much better version of, which I think I have. Um, go. So this is kind of how that works. Matt, if you want to talk about your your design here. Sure. Um, so <laughs> Eric uh, is a little younger than I am. I can go back, I I can go back um, to, the, <laughs> to the first. Iteration. A little more enthusiastic than I am. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so you can see the ammo can down there, right? Um, so Eric frequently has like really great ideas, uh, but, but he has so many ideas, easily half of them are crap. Like right out of the gate, half of them are terrible ideas. Um, the other half, maybe half of those are amazing, and the other half would be amazing, but they're too much work. So kind of when he and I are working together on stuff, the role we play, uh, the roles we play, he comes as sort of the diviner inspired. And I'm like, dude, that's a terrible idea. Get off my lawn. Um, he showed up at my house one day with that green ammo can and it is stuffed with like packing peanuts and like raspberry pies. It smells a little bit like electrical fire. Um, <laughs> there's like holes cut it in places and magnets. He's like, hey, dude, I figured out how to do wireless, like, remotely. We could just use an LTE modem and put it in this ammo can and then ship it. Um, so he came over to my house. I have a, have a two-story house. So we went up on my balcony on the top story and threw it off uh, to sort of simulate what happened with FedEx if we shipped one. And it, not surprisingly, uh, broke open and emptied its contents all over my driveway, um, which was hilarious because it made Eric make like the saddest face you've ever seen, right? But he had, he had come over, he had demonstrated that it was viable. It worked when it got here uh, until I went full jerk mode and tossed it off the patio. Un until um, everything it didn't was fine. <laughs> right, and then it didn't anymore. Uh, 
So we took basically Eric's Radio Shack build um, and like put it into a nice little gun case. We, we basically removed all of the sort of off the shelf components that Eric had used to sort of glue things together. Um, and like 3D printed uh, like an internal chassis, um, internal casing and components for everything so that we could actually expect the device to continue to work when we had to ship it to Canada, right? Or, or wherever it was going. Um, so we, we had substantial gains in, in sort of stability uh, with the devices like by going this route. Um, at this point, we're sort of, I think we're even in like the third iteration where we've replaced the pies uh, with like nooks, um, which allows us to do some cool SDR stuff, right? So we can throw like a USRP radio in there. Um, ba basically, you know, you want to do like low frequency, you want to do like 900 megahertz, like we have a platform, right, to, to cobble together that'll work with just about any wireless technology that you're employing. And and for those those of you that are kind of interested in, in how like it structurally kind of works, um, so in this one I kind of I just threw the Nook in there. Um, so the Nook basically communicates out via LTE back to our you know C2 our pen lab, um, and uh, I also keep a pie in it mostly because I just love pies and it's one of those things that I feel a little nostalgic and like I need to put one in just about everything. Um, but what is nice about having a pie that you can that you communicate only with over serial communication is that after you've compromised the network, you can always just join it directly to that network. And so there's no other um, you know, network that it's touching that's gonna mess anything up. You don't have to worry about any routing, any anything like that. So you have that extra that extra pie in there that, that definitely helps out. Um, and like Matt said too, uh, if you want to, you can, you know, we have we have one of these devices or actually multiple of these uh, boxes now that have, you know, B210s in there, which are super powerful, you know, software defined radio platform. Um, you know, we can throw in Ubertooth, no problem if we're going to do some Bluetooth testing um, or, you know, if we're going to do like some Apple Blee style attack. Um, Yardstick one, if we just want to do some some simple SDR stuff. And then um, the other one that I have too is another um, um, software defined radio that can basically mouse jack. So if you have a an older style wireless mouse and keyboard, um, you can basically like remotely send keystrokes to it because the encryption is broken on that. So. It's one of those things that is more of a platform, um, and and more importantly is that uh, you know it can be used as a device that we either mail to a client so we can do a pen test remotely, or it's a device that um, you know that we can take with us and you know basically add to our um, you know pen testing repertoire for doing like some kind of red team on site. Yeah, so these are Matt's fancy pictures, and again, I, I really it's should have included it in. Good. It's pretty much everything that was in the the backpack from those earlier. Like, yeah, just exactly. Into, uh, tiny pistol case. And the uh, the other funny part, I should have really, you know, maybe if we ever give this talk ever again, um, uh, I'll throw up some pictures of what my original iteration was because it was like I went to like Joanne's fabric and got like you know the the foam that you use to like reupholster a chair, and that was like I had like layers of that and raspberry pies in there. It was it was <laughs> it was one of those things. I look over him and I'm like, do you think this will catch on fire? Is this flammable? And he's just like, if you have to ask that question, like we need to change this. So uh, there's a there's a very certain lack of uh, packing nuts and foam in here. <laughs> um, and then yeah, Matt, if you want to if you want to talk about eap hammering, kind of what that is. Yeah. So so this talk is sort of weird. It's sort of a, like a general wireless talk, but it's really two parts. It's it's half the part we've done, which is like, hey, wireless. Here's, a, here's some stuff about it that you might not have thought of. And the other half of this is sort of trying to drive some change um, in the way that, that offensive security consulting services work. Uh, forever, wireless has been sort of that, that, you know, under your breath, like, oh, yeah, whatever. It's just a wireless network, right? Um, and before we started plumbing wireless up to SCADA, <laughs> That, that was a reasonable sort of assumption to operate on. Um, it's not anymore. Like we routinely take, a, you know, a quote unquote wireless assessment um, to control of SCADA or to compromise of all forests, all trusted forests, all trusted domains. Um, and it's interesting because clients generally 
are not used to that kind of focused attack on their wireless network, right? They're used to like somebody coming in with, with the cart and doing like heat maps um, and auditing for web, right? Uh, or stuff that was cutting edge a decade ago, maybe, I don't know. I haven't seen web in a long time. Um, but the, the idea is that your wireless really is just an extension of your internal network without any physical access control, right? Almost every place I go, you can get any of their wireless networks from the parking lot. Um, and we work with relatively large organizations. And so I know if it's affecting them, it's affecting smaller places too. But basically what, what you have is an internal, it's like, it's like if you put an ethernet jack in the alley behind your building. Um, and we see this so much, you know, we probably out of uh, a sample of like 10 wireless assessments that, that we'll do our team, we have four or five guys who do the majority of our wireless, probably somewhere between seven and nine of them will end in a complete compromise of the entire organization from wireless. Um, and, and it's low hanging fruit now because this is sort of a new model. Um, we're not there to do an assessment. We're there to show you what could happen, right? Um, and the tools that support wireless have gotten to the point where, where they're just amazing. Like ePammer is a, is a great example. ePammer, basically a wireless framework that will do all of your man in the middle, um, the authentication of in-range clients, uh, Karma, basically, so you can supply a SSID name that it will stand up a rogue AP for you. Um, you can provide a MAC address. When your target client is disconnected from their current session, your access point goes up matching not only the network wireless name, but also the BSSID, the MAC address of the access point. So you have a perfect spoof all that needs to happen is for that client to initiate authentication with you. And if they're not, if that wireless network is not doing both client and server side certificate validation, I will almost certainly get hash creds and I'll most likely get plain text creds if that's somebody with a BYOD phone or something that supports a GTC downgrade. So I don't even have to crack a hash at that point. And this tool, you know, if you're comfortable with some basic fundamentals of wireless and navigating Linux command line, this tool might take you an hour to become proficient enough at using to execute relatively sophisticated attacks. Um, and I think you sort of have this perfect, perfect storm where the tools have gotten really good and nobody is paying attention to wireless. Right, that's, that's the sort of other interesting takeaway in this. I've, gosh, last year I probably did 35 wireless assessments, probably did 30, let's say. Um, in my time in Securix, I've probably done 50 or 60. I have never seen a log from a point of contact at a client with any detection of anything I've ever done on their wireless network. I have gone to look at logs after a test and found that there were a ton of wireless notifications for rogue APs that I was standing up, but the wireless network's not important. So those just go straight to dev null, right? Like those don't get logged or aggregated. Um, so the, the rest of this talk really is sort of about shifting that paradigm from wireless being like this thing that we don't really need to worry about to wireless being this thing that we really should pay attention to. Um, I'll sort of kick it back to you here, Eric. You guys hear me okay? Sorry, I got I got bounced off for a second. Yeah, I hear you all right. Cool, all right. And so you got the next, uh, the big SDR, WRTA up.
Erica, are you there? So you can see, I'm gonna try to cover for Eric here for a minute. You can see this is uh, sort of the latest iteration of the, so we call the, the wireless remote testing appliances, WRTAs, right? Pretty, pretty creative acronym. Um, you can see these ones are a little bigger. They actually have, uh, I think they're 40 millimeter fans, top and bottom there for push pull. Um, there's a couple iterations of that. That's actually the one that we use to send out the USRPs, um, the, the SDR radios from Edis, uh, for sort of non-traditional, non 2.4, non 5 gigahertz wireless testing. Um, we also have a box that looks a lot like that. And if you've been on any of the other B-sides on the East Coast, you might have seen Michael Bryant uh, lugging one of those around with a whole bunch of pies in it doing sort of the wireless traveling CTF that we have set up. Um, yeah, so what looks like the USRP radios are on the right-hand side there. We've got a panel on the back. And it's interesting because Eric is driving. Yeah, can, can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> I'm, there we I'm go. Back. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't, it, it's like, it keeps like momentarily dropping out. But yeah, no, Matt covered it perfectly. Um, this, this device basically just extends way past the uh, Wi-Fi and gets you into the range of pretty much every loop. But he's wireless, right? Like I can open your garage door with this. I can, uh, you know, disable your Simply Safe alarm, you know, at home with this. Like, I mean, it does it does a ton of stuff, right? So this is basically just to show that wireless is anywhere that there's not wires. Um, and so to think that Wi-Fi is just this niche test, or wireless a wireless pen test is just a niche test that like you know only super big organizations need or require. Um, it's kind of the opposite, right? Every you know everything that doesn't have um, a wire, which is now everything is, is, you know, susceptible and vulnerable. You look at all the Bluetooth sharing options that are out there. You look at, um, you know, just how you can cast from one device to another. You look how, you know, you open pretty much anything now. Um, if I'm able to hop on that connection, whether, you know, no matter what wireless means are there, um, you know, it's a fun place to be for an adversary. And especially too, because one of the things that I found is that, uh, wireless is one of those technologies, uh, or wireless in general is just, Technology is susceptible to being super old um, because everything has to be backwards compatible. Everything has to work in general, right? And so that's where that's where manufacturers get into a bit of a bind of of you know like hey even if there is WPA3 out there, um, you know what's going to support that? How long is WPA2 still going to be around? I mean look look how long WEP um, you know still was around. Like I, I don't see it very often anymore, but um, you know it's still in some places. Like I mean I've seen it in the past couple of you know in the past couple of months I've seen, um, you know, web on client sites. Uh, it's, it's not common, but and everybody knows that it's broken and yet it's still out there. And I, I can only imagine that WPA2 is going to be the same way. Um, so it's one of those things that, that I think the, the point that we're trying to drive home is that wireless is, is not a niche test. It's not a niche pen test. Um, in fact, it should be, you know, included uh, as a part of like a trifecta of internal, external and wireless because, um, uh, because if I were to ask a client right now, hey, uh, can you go pull up your wireless logs? A lot of times they'll just get a blank stare of like, oh, like they may not even be taking logs, um, let alone doing any detection. Um, let's see if I can flip to the next slide. Yeah, so um, just I'll, I'll do a quick story and then uh, Matt can just obviously just fill in or if my audio cuts out. Um, I just I was on a pen test this last uh, last month. Um, he was for uh, it was for some some large company, right? And uh, what happened in it is they they had purchased an internal pen test, an external pen test, and a wireless pen test. So kind of the the perfect um, sweet spot that I kind of feel like of of uh, covering all their bases. Um, you know, everything from the wireless looks pretty darn good. Um, there, you know, it's it's a little bit of an interesting time right now because obviously COVID, there's not a lot of users in the office. Um, and like I was talking about before, uh, you need user, you know, you need end user interaction typically to gain some sort of credentials. Um, but paired with one of our external penetration tests, uh, you know, they did some password spraying against Office 365. Um, and even though the Office 365 instance required multi-factor authentication, um, we basically said, well, what are the odds that, uh, that even though Office 365 requires MFA that I can just reuse those credentials to, to hop on their wireless network? Sure enough. Um, you know, those users' credentials, even though they were, they had two-factor authentication um, on Office 365, worked just fine to get me into the wireless network and the, on their corporate network. Um, and I think it was four hours later that we had, you know, compromised their domain, um, and another four hours later to where 
we were SCADA administrator on this, um, you know, on this ICS platform. Um, and it was a, it was an inter interesting place to be as an attacker. And I don't say this as like the, oh my gosh, look at Eric, big bad hacker, look what he can do. But it, it really gave our clients the ammunition, you know, to say, hey, this is, this is what was included in the report. And it turned um, our clients from saying, hey, we know that this is an issue to their board. You know, somebody could do something, somebody could attack us in this way, somebody could gain access in this way to say, hey, somebody did gain access to us in under a week, um, you know, leveraging all of our technology and we didn't, we didn't even see them coming. Um, and so that's, that's really what, what I think I'm trying to get at as, as kind of like the final piece of this is, is that wireless is a, is a part of a broader range of pen testing, you know, activities, um, but it, it is just as dangerous. It is just as lethal. It's not a niche thing. Um, and really at the end of the day, it's, it's not so that we can, you know, say, oh, look at us, like, look how cool we are. It's, it's so that our clients, you know, they have a, an awareness of what a nation state, uh, you know, they have the awareness of what a, um, you know, persistent adversary actually would do. It's not, it's not a Nessus scan where, you know, they're going to get a report that just has, oh, you have, you know, this, you know, SSL v3 somewhere. It's, hey, this is how we are able to access, um, you know, the data that keeps you up at night. Um, so anyways, yeah. That, that's kind of my story. I don't know if Matt wants to go into his story or kind of elaborate on that one, but um, but yeah, I just I think that illustrates nicely the like the point of of combining different types of pen testing to to leverage full domain compromise. Yeah, you you also had another interesting sort of point in there, Eric, and and you hinted at it, but I think it's worth saying flat out: if you are partnering with a, a, an entity who's doing penetration testing for you, whether it's wireless or or internal or external. If if that company is worth working with, their goal is to give you, as their client, the leverage that you need to affect positive security change on your network, right? If you're not getting that back, you should go find another provider who is actually looking to partner with you to help you make your things more secure. I still run into people doing this kind of work um, where they, where they want to, you know, flex Uber elite with their, with their technical skills. Um, and, you know, there was a place in time for that. Like b before we started seeing some semblance of maturity in, in, you know, security consulting space, like that, that was a reasonable thing because you had to kind of shock and awe people into, wait a second, these computer things, we got to watch out for stuff. Um, but at this point, the people that you want breaking in to your place are the people whose goal is to provide you the leverage to affect the change that you already know is is requisite, right, for your network. Um, wireless fits into that really well, but that should be the general approach that you're getting from any security vendor, service-based security vendor that you're working with. You want somebody who's bringing you leverage so that, you know, you can get the budget you need to go do the projects that you want to do. Um, so it's not, it's not really story time, but it is, it is a thing that I get from our clients frequently that, that, you know, our team is the, the SecureWorks adver adversarial testing group, right? And we get different responses to that. The, the, a lot of sort of the ELT C-suite folk are like, well, why would we call it adversarial testing? I mean, it's because of the mindset, right? We, we think about how somebody would actually attack you. It's not adversarial in that I'm going to be a jerk when we're talking on the phone. Um, so it, it's not a cool story time, but it is sort of a general, general approach. Like if, if you're not, getting actionable information and, and intel and demonstration of issues on your network from your providers, like go find a provider who will get it for, who give you what you need, um, sort of tackle the big rocks on your network. Um, I, you know, there's so many vendors out there. Go, go try a vendor. If, if your experience at this point has not been, you know, what you think it should be, go try somebody else, whether that's SecureWorks or, or anybody else out there. It's better than continuing on with somebody who's demonstrated that they're not really interested in providing you with the service that you want, right? Which is some help getting leverage to fix stuff.
Um, I feel like I feel like this is very much uh, uh, like, hey, you go to the doctor, you should go exercise 30 minutes a day and eat your fruits and vegetables. It's stuff that you know you should be doing. It's stuff that's good for the health of your organization, but it helps to hear it and it helps to, I feel like it's just one of the things, it, it helps to, you know, hear it again and reinforce it again and again and again. Um, so again, yeah, m maybe it's not a super sexy wireless zero day dropping or anything like that, but, um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, I've, I've never broken into a client with a zero day. It's always been, you know, um, finding some some security control that, that's not patched or a person that's not talked to. Um, yeah. And they're usually known, they're usually things that client points of contact know, know are problems, right? It, we're not, we're not we're frequently not finding things that they didn't know, right? We, we find unknown unknowns, that happens, that's great. Um, but, but frequently we're abusing stuff that they knew we were going to abuse. Like, yeah, just, just like Eric said. <laughs> Anyways, with that, uh, does anybody have any questions for us? I don't know if I can change the presenter view or. Uh, yeah, I'm looking in the chat and in Discord as well. I think. And I think the one question that comes up is, this is great, especially I appreciate because uh, you guys come in and I have a couple of my students from my Greenbelt Tech class, is how does somebody get, you know, what's the best way or if you have suggestions on how somebody gets started in Wi-Fi security? I think the, the first step is to mess around with your home network. Um, you know, get, if you, if you don't already have it, um, you know, get a, a wireless card or wireless adapter that, um, support something called monitor mode. Basically, if you just look on Amazon, there's there's an adapter that I use for pretty much everything. It's just called a Panda. It's like a PAU 900, 600. I think it's a 600, PAU 600. Um, but it's basically dual band, which means it does 5.8 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. It can go into monitor mode on both, which basically just means that it can, uh, um, you know, you can basically unlock a little bit more um, uh, features in it then you know without getting super technical you can unlock some some features in it that uh you know linux tools can take advantage of um and then the other part of that too is that you get out of it um uh you know just to be able you can plug it into a laptop i recommend you know getting a raspberry pi because shocking i'd recommend a raspberry pi um but it's it's a cheap easy little platform you don't have to mess with like your main operating system or do anything to get stuff to work um and really you can you can take that and look at your own home network obviously don't mess with any network that's not yours um, and just see, hey, can you recover your own password, you know, by watching a couple of YouTube videos, watching a couple of talks on, on how wireless technology works. And I think, I think that's the best place to go, um, just to see what you can do on your own network. And then, um, you know, and then just, you can, I mean, the beautiful part is everybody has a wireless network typically that they have that's their own. Um, and, and if you don't, it's cheap and easy to just get like a little access point that you can, you know, do your, do your tax against. So um, that'd be my recommendation is, is check out that Panda wireless adapter, um, watch a couple of talks, watch a couple of videos. And then if you have the opportunity to go to any conferences, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I think the ones I can think of are like ShmooCon, um, if you're on the East Coast, uh, besides Delaware, if you go to um, shoot, I mean, next year besides Greenville, like basically just, just look for conferences and see if they have any wireless village, um, because then you'll be able to talk to, talk to people that, that know stuff and they'll probably have some challenges for you. Well, that makes Bad sense. Energy. I appreciate that. A lot of food for thought. Uh, a couple other questions. Uh, so what are the common issues you come across in household Wi-Fi other than us creating a spoof? So other other things that we see, um, like other attacks that we that we perform or other other just like um, like misconfigurations. Yeah, Is maybe. Yeah, I read that word for word, but <clears throat> maybe, yeah, just common other issues that, that you see in Wi-Fi just in general. Then I'll let you, uh, you want to. Yeah, so so many things start start with a spoof, right? Because ultimately the goal is, is to get credentialed access. Um, and if you're trying to convince somebody, maybe, maybe you're not even spoofing. Um, you know, corporate networks. Maybe, maybe you're watching what those client devices are beaconing for, and you see, you know, whatever, Mac, Comcast, home router, 
So I spoof Matt's Comcast home router and get an auto connect. Um, it, it's hard to even. So Eric made a comment earlier about everything that is not wired is wireless. And that's, that's a really big statement um, that kind of broke me at first because, because it's so ubiquitous, right? Uh, it's everywhere. So to try to think of what other common things, right? As a, as a corporate network pen tester, I'm, I'm breaking into corporate wireless. I'm spoofing stuff. Um, but I've, you know, gosh, the, the thing I always think of is when I travel with my little like Roku stick and I have my, my little LTE access point that I set up to spoof my home network name so that my Roku stick will auto connect, right? It's, it's that same, it's that same idea, right? Like I'm just taking things that I know must exist for this technology to work. There must be a way for it to communicate in some back channel, right? Um, and sort of shining, shining light on that, and almost always some, some hack falls out. Um, gosh, stuff that stuff that I don't even, I can't even think of anything that I've done recently that didn't involve spoofing an AP in some way to get think, to establish initial access. I think the other thing too that that is a much bigger problem uh, that maybe people don't realize is just just the sheer fact of. Uh, you know, your normal Wi-Fi that you that you have at home, your pre-shared key. A lot of organizations will have a you know instead of running um, you know an enterprise network where everybody is required to use a username and password to log into Wi-Fi, uh, they just all have a shared password, and that's that's so that's so damaging because it only takes one employee to give it to their you know girlfriend or wife or kid. It only takes one employee to get fired. Um, you know, to where then you're left you were left with, oh shoot, do we change the wireless password every time that we get a new employee or we fire a new or we fire an employee? Um, you know, there's nothing, there's no way to stop, uh, you know, a, a person from just giving that out to somebody else. There's no like, you know, certificates, there's nothing, right? And so I, I think that's another thing that, that maybe isn't, you know, um, something that we directly leverage in a pen test. You know, we're not, we're not typically always you know, I mean, I've, I've called in and vished a couple of people into giving me a wireless password, but but typically that's not what we do. But but with those kind of pre-shared key networks where one key gets you onto that network, um, anybody can share it. It can be posted in a conference room. And so it's not the super sexy like, oh, man, look at this like way that, that we broke in. But it's just one of those things that if you run a wireless network to just kind of keep in mind that um, that that just anybody can hand out that key and you're only as strong as that one key. There's no second factor authentication or anything like that. Right, exactly. It's, it's scary when we see uh, networks with just that one key and maybe a very simple key at that. Yeah. Certificates are good, right? Yeah, well, and especially too, because yeah. you have so many like IoT devices out there, right? Like so many just random devices that don't have screens that you need to somehow connect to a wireless network. And so more and more now you're seeing a bunch, you know, like, like companies will have a guest network, they'll have a corporate network, and we'll have an IoT network. And a lot of times their IoT network is the same level of access as their internal corporate network. And so the only thing that changes there is like, uh oh, now like all of you know your security cameras and your conference bridges and all that stuff don't work. And so all it takes is me spoofing that to now have the same level of access. Um, so it's just, just one of those and things. And you'll see like network access controls, right? Like on the internal network. But all you have to do is start looking at wireless for, for things on IoT because you know they got stuck on IoT probably because they don't support certificate auth. So you, you, you spoof a map on one of those, connect to IoT, and you just bypass network access control because you don't need to be physically connected. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that, where you, you don't well, have that capability yeah. on those IoT devices. Right. And where and where that where that is really 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 scary is uh, we do a bunch I mean we've done a bunch of tests for hospitals right when all of a sudden your insulin <laughs> pump when all of a sudden you're like you know uh, you know some controller for some life saving device in the OR you see the is, medical like, device or UI come up and you're just like no 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 stop. Escape yeah, you're escape. like, oh, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to start de-offing a device as they're in active surgery, right? Like, like those are the things that, like, you know, it, oh, is it a bummer if you know somebody kicks your Nest thermostat off and like your house gets a little warmer? Yeah, that's a bummer. 
But you know what's even more they do that to your liver, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when when it's all of a sudden, you know, somebody spikes your blood sugar via Wi-Fi like that, that's a problem. Um, and so it is one of those things that, yeah, again, it's not it's not something immediately thought of or super sexy, but uh, somebody with a shared password for all of the, you know, medical devices that all meet this one criteria in in a hospital, they if they all have their own network, if somebody hops on that network, um, a lot of times, especially with with um, with critical, you know, I, I would consider that to be critical infrastructure um, is that they're given a wide berth as far as security goes, you know, they're given more access than they probably need because nobody wants to be the guy that, you know, stopped some life saving device from working because, uh, you know, the actual have to put a guy in a coma yeah. to update the firmware. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, no. and so, they, no. and so they, they, they don't want to restrict that. And so because of that, if you can hop on that network, you know, um, you know, to basically take advantage of that, that wide hallway you get to go through. Now, all of a sudden, uh oh, that that was the way that a user got in. Um, and, and it doesn't even really have to do with whatever the device is. It's just that is a that is a uh, a method that, that an attacker would use um, that's typically not seen. Right. So, I mean, maybe that's not at the heart of the question, um, but but it is one thing just to, I, I think it's just interesting to kind of keep in mind. Oh, definitely. No, I appreciate the uh, additional insights. Definitely. A lot to think about there. Uh, my mind's <laughs> kind of circling back. <laughs> yeah, right. Kind of gay. <laughs> we are, let's see, it's about 12.11. So we're going to be on lunch break to 12.45. Eric, Matt, thank you again very, very much for coming in and sharing with everybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, for those of you still listening in, uh, Eric's going to be on the pen test panel, the pen test firing squad at 2.45 in this track as well. So uh, get the uh, return of uh, Eric um, later this afternoon. So yeah, we'll be out break uh, until 12.45. Um, Eric and Matt, thanks again. And uh, there actually are a couple more questions in the Discord channel if you guys have a chance to jump in there. Um, I'm sure the folks would love the opportunity to chat with you guys. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys after lunch. But thanks again. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank Great, you thanks, guys. Michael.